Hey folks, and welcome to Typology, the show in which we explore the mystery of the human personality through the lens of the Enneagram. My name is Anthony Skinner. I'm the producer of the show, and we have a really, really exciting show for you today. We have Ken Coleman on the show, okay? Now, Ken was on the show a while back, but he misidentified himself as an eight, and on the show, he sort of got a little bit of the revelation that he might not be an eight, he might be another number. Then, right after that, we had one of his uh, co-workers, someone that he works with at the Ramsey Network, Rachel Cruz, the daughter of Dave Ramsey, and uh, she thought we were onto something as well, that he might not be the eight that he thought he was. Now, Ken is the number one uh, national best-selling author of The Proximity Principle, and of course, he has The Ken Coleman Show, which he hosts uh, as a part of the Ramsey Network, and it's a nationally syndicated radio show that airs on 51 stations across the nation. He's a trusted voice that's been featured on Forbes, uh, Fox Business uh, Network, and Yahoo, uh, Finance, Rachel Ray Show, on and on and on and on. Ken is an amazing guy, and uh, he has a revelation. He goes away, does some more work, comes back, and we talk about uh, where he misidentified himself and what number he actually is. So I think you're really, really going to enjoy this show. So without any further ado, here's Ken Coleman and the host of our show. Ian Cron. Ken Coleman, welcome back to Typology. Oh, it's always good to be with you, friend. And I can't believe I'm back this quickly. That means there's got to be something wrong with me. There must be a deep dive in store. Yeah, well, we um, two things happened. One is it's like being called back to the principal's office, and uh, and secondly, we uh, we uncovered some profoundly deep pathologies in your personality. <laughs> None <laughs> of this is a surprise, unfortunately. <laughs> and we, we we just thought it'd be really good for our people to see what sick looks like. <laughs> right. Hey, listen, if that's how I got to add value, what not to be, then then that's my mantle. I'm taking it. <laughs> All right. Well, let me give people a little background into uh, why we're having you back on the show, why I'm so excited that you're, you're, you're back. The last time you were on the show, you told, the, you told me in our, our listening audience that you were an eight, the challenger. For those people who don't know much about challengers, two sentences. Uh, they are uh, combative, notoriously blunt, ag aggressive people who uh, have a need to control others in the environment to assert strength over others in the environment in order to mask feelings of weakness and vulnerability. So that's a quick thumbnail sketch of the, of the eight. Now, during the course of our, our conversation, and because I knew you a, a bit and had spoken to others uh, in your immediate universe, um, I kept thinking to myself, as, is, as has happened on many an occasion on this show, I kept thinking, I don't think so. Like, but but, but I, I try to always hold myself back and not be presumptuous and think, oh, I know so. I'm always like, huh. And so we were going through the interview. I think I mentioned, have you ever read up on threes? And you were like... I don't, I'm not sure if you had or not. Uh, no, I, I hadn't. No, I, I hadn't. Okay, and then I said to you what? You're like, I want you to read, commit to me that you're going to read the, the chapter on threes and, and really soak on it and think about it. And you gave me, I think it was like a four or five days. <laughs> and I want the audience to know I got a reminder text on like day three or four because <laughs> he is a world-class therapist beyond everything else. That he knew that, that uh, I'm administratively challenged. Uh, <laughs> and so, and so I was like, I promise, dude, I'm going to read it. And uh, I did read it. And, um, and I very much felt like those who do work close with me, who've been, some have been on your program. They were like, I think you're a three Ken. And I absolutely felt, uh, like that was the case. And so it was eye opening for me. Right. So after you read it, you were like, Whoa. So one of the things that we've learned here is, and I tell this people all the time, you got to know all nine types. I mean, you really have to read all nine types. Right. If you think you know your type and just read that chapter, you may mm -hmm. actual, actually do confirmation bias and just automatically assume, oh, yeah, sounds like me. That's, you know, that often happens. 
Claire Diaz Ortiz, as I think you and I spoke about the other day, yeah. she thought she was a one for 10 years because she hadn't read the other eight numbers. In the middle of the interview, I said, Claire, I have bad news for you. <laughs> <laughs> you have spent two years in a delusional episode. I, I said, I need you to go home and read threes. And we had a, we're gonna have a conversation that's different, but under the same sort of mm -hmm. circumstance that we did with that, that episode with Claire, who was a, believed she was a one, but actually was a three. Um, all you gotta do is look at her resume and it's it it actually screams three at you when yeah, you yeah. when you when you read it. Game changer revelation for her too, man. Oh to my gosh! Episode one and then episode two. You need to go back and check those out. Our listeners need to. Yeah, that was uh, it, that was extraordinary. All right, mm -hmm. so when you read about the three, okay, uh, what did you think? Why did you think? Did you come up with any conclusions as to why you thought you were an eight? Uh, yeah, it was like a, you, yeah, it was like a neon flashing light, you know, that just was basically saying um, that you you're driven to perform. You're driven by you know my one of my five love languages is has always been affirmation, mm. and so mm -hmm. that affirmation desire uh, I've always enjoyed performing, and um, the if I'm being completely honest, which I am. I've always wondered why I love performing so much. Why do I love live radio and television and speaking? And why did I sign up for every play, you know, in, in, in middle school and high school? I really do love the performance side of it. But if I really dig down into it, is that I love the tension between the, the, the pressure to win the audience. You know, this right. I've got to perform well. So there's tension to actually know your part or do a good job on the radio or do a good job on a talk or a keynote or whatever it is, or write a good book. There's a tension between the actual delivery of something good. You've got, there's tension there. And, and then there's the tension with, will the audience like it? And it's a sick challenge to be honest with you. I mean, I, 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 I but that's what it's about. And it's, it's this, if you're really raw about it, I think that's what I looked, when I read the chapter, I went, this speaks to who I really am. Cause I really enjoy uh, the hard work and the nerves and the pressure to perform because of the back end of that is I did something for the audience that they appreciated. Mm -hmm. Right. So when we were on your porch the other day, uh, we had a, a small conversation about this. I mean, clearly the eights can be, people who love performing. Let's take, right. I, I have a funny feeling Robert De Niro is an eight. Yeah. So, you know, you know, obviously he loves performing, right? So enjoying performing is not unique to threes, but the reason you would enjoy performing would be very different than the reason Robert De Niro would enjoy performing. Mm. Right. What That's you've right. got, what you emotionally, the emotional payoff for you is different than it is for him, right? Because he's a, a, a different type. So, I, I wanted to just maybe throw some, well, a couple of things out at you. Number one, as I think I told you on the show that day, threes and eights often get mistyped as each other. Okay. Why is that? All right. So initially, lots of threes think they're eights. And what's interesting is that the opposite rarely happens, which is an eight thinking they're a three. Interesting. Okay? So, um, number one, uh, threes and eights both get stuff done, a lot of stuff done, and they enjoy getting a lot of stuff done. They're both energetic. Uh, they both like to be respected. Okay, respect is a, a theme for, for both. Um, they, uh, how else can I say this? Uh, I would say that they both feel, can feel, like their nose get put out of joint when they're not respected. Mm. You, you know what I'm saying? Like they oh, do. So, I know what you're saying. My poor kids, they're, they're going, Hey man, <laughs> like respect so how, is how a did, core value, man. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a big thing for them. Right. Um, the, some of the differences are that threes do care what people think about them. Very much. Uh, you, you're in the image conscious triad, twos, threes, and fours. Um, you you, you, you want to be loved. You tend to equate at times when you're unhealthy, love and success. 
you, you draw some kind of an equivalent between the two um, or attention and love, right? Um, whereas an eight could care less what others think about them. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I'm saying? It's like yep. the three is always kind of looking in people's eyes and unconsciously adapting their image to win the approval and the love or admiration and respect of the person they're talking to. Yep. That can also go for an audience, by the way. And we spoke about this. Like when yep. you go on stage, what are you great at? Connecting with the audience, you know, keeping their attention. You know, I, I think that's probably this, the one skill that I have mm. um, that I would be confident in is that I can hold an audience, whether it be on radio or even if I'm interviewing you, is the ability to keep the audience's attention. Or even if I'm interviewing you, I can keep the audience's attention. <laughs> <laughs> of course, the way you say it that way. All right, folks, let me teach for a moment. This is exhibit A, when somebody takes your words and twists them out of context with just the slightest focus on emphasis. Now, the point is, is that when I'm doing an interview and it's not about me, right? And, but I've got to keep the audience engaged with good questions. Right. There's just yeah. something there to keep attention. But I, I want to go back a second on this three thing because I hope other threes get something out of this because what I really got out of this when I really typed the right way is that what confused me about the eight versus the three is that when I'm unhealthy or let's just say there's a trigger of respect that you just mentioned, and it really made me think of this that's when I can present to myself as an eight or maybe to other people as an eight because I can get pretty intense. But the difference between the three and the eight is, is, is while I'm in this unhealthy moment, maybe I'm feeling disrespected or whatever. And I feel like I got to fight for myself or whatever. And maybe you're a bit too intense. Um, I have the ability to read it in the moment. And as a three, I think it's the three ability to kind of go, Ooh, ooh I just went way too hard there. And then you start to go, oh, gosh, I was a total creep, jerk, you know, I, that's not good. I ran all over him. I feel awful about it. And it feels Jekyll Hyde. Mm. Yes. Yeah. So an eight would not have that response. That's right. The eight's the, like, the, whatever, get over it, wipe the tire tracks off of you. Or yes. they don't even know. Well, or they don't even know. Right. Right. Now, this, now we're talking about people in that average to low average range, right? We're not talking about a highly evolved eight who would know and be, you know, would be in tune to other people's feelings. Right. But, but you just described an affective response to having, you have enough self-awareness and because you're a three and you are in that feeling triad along with twos and fours, heart triad, you pick up on the fact, uh oh, I just, hurt somebody and you you felt remorse oh yeah and sure. and then i'm sure there's a part of you if you have time or inclination and you're in a good space you'll go back and try and repair the breach every time i'm now i'm just gonna tell you i don't know if this is a three thing or a whacked out coleman version of three but i need closure man mm. i i need i need closure when i messed up tell me I more really about i that. really I just can't, I can't function at my fullest if I know that I've hurt somebody right. or I wrong somebody and I don't fix it. Right. That's very interesting. So that makes me wonder, and you'll have to figure this out, if you're a three with a two wing. Mm -hmm. I think I'm a three with a two. When I read the wings, I mean, you know, I mean, as you've taught me, there's so much of this stuff that kind of can come in and out and, so I'm learning to kind of hold this loosely and not be so rigid yeah. with it. But I think I'm a two wing because of, uh, uh, of the desire to, uh, to win socially, not just be liked, but, but actually to have good relationships. I, I, yes. I desire good relationships. Yes. I really do. Well, you're affectionate. Um, you're a great host in your home. These are all two qualities. Mm -hmm. But what you were also just saying uh, is very two, which is when a two experiences a breach in relationship or even a perceived breach in a relationship, they have trouble sleeping. Like, like it really, they, they need closure and they need it quick. And sometimes if they're unhealthy, they'll take the blame for something they shouldn't just to get the closure. Like, I you know what I'm saying? 
do I know what you're saying? I mean, I'm going to let it all hang out here. Uh, <laughs> I do this with, I do this with my kids. My wife points it out to me right. that I will, you know, that I will, they'll get upset at me just doing basic parenting. And when they get upset with me, even though I've done, her point is you didn't do anything wrong. You were calm. You didn't exacerbate the situation. It was just, you're being a dad there and they don't like it. And all of a sudden you're trying to apologize. Right. That right. absolutely happens. And then I'll tell you this, this is really sick. I genuinely need to know right now <laughs> if you thought that I was, was insulting you, like when I said, even if I'm interviewing you, like I need to know that you, you know that I wasn't <laughs> saying it like an Ian thing. <laughs> no, dude, you were just setting me up for a good moment. <laughs> I, I thought so, but I need to know. Like I was going to ask no. after the interview, but I thought, well, why not just have some fun with it so these people can really see how neurotic Coleman is. But no, I mean, that's really true. You don't – I think the wing two and the three combo is that we, 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 we just desperately want to make people happy. Yes. So there's that two thing. You want to win people's admiration and respect. Uh, the three achiever has a need to succeed, to appear successful, yeah. and to win at times, to win at all costs, and uh, when they're not in a great space, but mostly to avoid failure at all costs. That, that rings terrifying. more with me. That okay, rings tell me more, about that. Well, when you present it that way, I mean, I think it's true that anybody unhealthy can, can get to a really, really dark place and, and, and just do whatever it takes to win. Um, but when you said to to not fail at all costs, that's very much that rings with me. I I remember thoughts like that when I was fifteen and sixteen. Mm. Really, really wanting to figure out what it is I was created to do and and mm. call on my life, um, because I I just didn't. I, I used to say weird things that I laugh at it now. You know, as a kid, I thought it was pretty cool you know, cause there's a three, I care how it sounds. And, uh, so, you know, I would say things like, I just, I just, I want people to, to know that I, that I lived and that I made a huge impact. And it was always mm -hmm. about, I want to make a big impact. And I want to figure out what that big impact is. And, uh, I think that comes from a fear of, of not making a difference. So here's to me, that's failure, by the way, I'm going to give you something to put on your desk. Uh, and I may have said this, before I just wrote it down over here so I remember it. Um, and this is for all threes, uh, particularly if you're a person of faith. And, and not all of my audience identifies that way, but some doesn't. But I think this is something anyone could walk away with feeling like, okay, that 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 has value. Um, Saint Augustine, I think, was a three. And Augustine was a brilliant orator, uh, rhetorician, uh, not rhetorician, rhetorician. Uh, he was known throughout uh, his part of the world as, a, as just as a brilliant speaker and thinker. Um, and it, he went through a season where um, his success, which was enormous, really got to his head, right? And thought very highly of himself, then became a Christian, okay? And he wrote a lot on the topic of ambition. Uh, and he actually doesn't say ambition is bad. He thinks that ambition properly bridled is okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what he struggled with was the source of love. Was it the crowd? Mm. Uh, or was it his ego? Was it God? Right? Like, like, that's where he saw the rub. So he has a great quote. And he says, and I say this, by the way, when, right before I go on stage, whether it's at Ramsey or somebody place else, I always say this. I, well, I say two things. One is this prayer of St. Augustine. Lord, let it be for your sake that I am loved. Mm. Now, that is a great prayer because mm -hmm. what he's saying is it's okay to want to be loved. Mm -hmm. That's right. Just let it be for your sake. That's right. Mm -hmm. Right. That's exactly right. I mean, that's, that's a right. powerful idea to me. Let it be for, you know, not for my sake, just let it be for your sake yeah. that I am loved. Meaning, that's absolutely right. That means then when people come up to you and say, great job, great mm -hmm. performance, you were mm -hmm. awesome, you've changed my life. You can just say thank you. You don't have to have any false humility or modesty. Right. You can say thank you. 
Right. As long as in the back of your mind, you're like, God, let it be for your sake that I am loved. That's it. You know, it's true, um, man. It's about performing for one and just saying, you know what? You gave me these gifts. I need to make these gifts count for you. And um, right. that's, that's definitely been a driving force for me. I think it was unhealthy as a kid though, because you're yes. just, you're not mature enough to handle it, but it was always, it was always coming from, Hey, I, I know I got one shot at this. I want to make it count. And um, yeah. it's, it's key yeah. because you and I, we're in a, we're in a weird situation and there's, we're, there's way more notable people than us. But the fact is, is when you get into some of this notoriety or platform, what are you going to call it? Um, I have found that at first it's, it's quite nice. That for well, me, it's intoxicating. It's intoxicating. Inti it, it is. It's quite nice. However, it wears off, I think. And I think that once it gets to the point where you've had it enough, then it better be about the work itself. You better love what you're doing and you know, yeah. you're doing it for the one yeah. who created you. I, I, I agree with yeah. that prayer. That's such yeah. a good thing. That's good. I, I had a, I was on somebody's podcast. That's a speaking uh, guru. And uh, he said, what's the one hint you should give your, uh, to people out there who are aspiring public speakers. And I said, sincerely love your audience. That's mm. it sincerely love your audience it's not about you know Gosh, technique is good. important having good content is important but nothing is more important than your audience sensing when you walk out on stage that they are not uh, a money ticket a yep. that it's not about you winning their applause but that you genuinely want the best for them and that you're there to help them that's really arrive good at that point. that's really good um hey let me add yeah. something to that because ian just dropped gold on you all let me just add one little thing to that. That's why when I have like people call my show or young aspiring speakers come to me and go, Hey, how do I figure out what I want to speak about? So I always drive them to what you just said, which is who are the people you most want to speak to, to help because you better have a driving, driving mission for the audience. The message will come, but you better know who you want to help. Yeah, absolutely. So let's pop back. You're an achiever performer. Uh, you thought you were a challenger. Let me just also give you some other differences. We've already laid out some. Why that misidentification may have happened. Um, did you have an eight parent? Um, I think my dad has some eight tendencies, but I'm not willing to say that he's a that he's a, a full blown eight. Okay. The reason I ask is sometimes a three who grows up around an eight, because you're all what we call a three sevens and eights. We all, are all aggressive or assertive numbers. We call them. Yeah. Um, they, if you, if a three grows up with an eight, it's not hard for them to pick up some of the aggression of the eight. You know what I mean? Like another yes. five, like another 5%, right? Um, well, let me say, let me, you, let me ask you this though. That, I'm glad okay. you brought this up. Okay. So, because I thought about this before our conversation today, I was going to ask you how much of this is wiring versus environmental? Because I will say this, <laughs> my dad was a hard driver. I don't right. think he's a true eight, but right. I think that he, let's put it this way. I was not a good student. Okay. Just never was a good student. I had did well on aptitude tests. And so it frustrated my dad to no end. who was a national honor society student you know, uh, went to University of Michigan on an engineering degree. I mean, the guy's brilliant, very smart, straight A's. Uh, and I was not that kid. I only did well in classes that I was interested in, <laughs> which was, right. which was history and Bible. Everything else was like, really? And I couldn't pay attention to it. Um, and I was a, I was a really bad student, uh, you know, a C and D kid. And it caused a lot of tension and he would, he would do and say some things that we've since gotten healthy and it's all, you know, it's all good now, but he was trying to wake me up and say, you're going right. to be pumping gas if you don't get good grades. So I, I got to tell you, when I heard stuff like that, I was like, I'll show you. And it was a giant chip on my shoulder. Right. And I'm not so sure Ian that that chip is completely gone. I think I, I think I can default and put it up there when I need it. Mm. And then I try to be aware of it enough to take it off most of the time. So I say all that to ask you how much of this is environmental. Maybe my dad wasn't an eight, but 
uh, that confrontation and that the, the way I was kind of dealt with, it turned me into a, is it possible it turned me into a bit of a performer? Well, yes. Uh, but let's answer yes to, you just asked two questions there. One was about your relationship with your dad. Could that have influenced your becoming a performer? The other one was, is it hard wiring or? Right, you know, right, right, right. So let's, say, let's say answer the first one. I say, first of all, that personality, the, the nuts and bolts of a human personality are probably in place around the age of five or six. Okay. Okay. So, you, you know, uh, it's wet cement, but, but all the basics are in place. Okay. Uh, you are born with a temperament or disposition that contain what we call fixed traits. Okay. So, you know this, uh, you have children, you know that, that some kids just come out anxious. Some just come out depressives. Some just come out uh, like sunny side up like yeah. you know like my son Aiden like where everything is just joy I mean yeah. every kid has a certain amount of hardwiring with fixed traits my son could could not ever change that fundamental optimism at his core about life he yeah. couldn't yep. that's a fixed trait now he could let's say uh, uh, now he's an extrovert right so um, he's never not going to be an extrovert, but he can learn to dial it back, right? In other words, to steward that part of his hard one, yep. mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. so it's not like I can't do anything about it. It's like, mm, actually, you can. You can dial that back. It's just going to burn calories. It's going to cost you energy mm -hmm. to do it, and you won't be able to do it forever, right? Right. Um, and then, then we have what are called free traits in our personality, which are much more open to being ch actually changed, okay? Now, um, your personality then is partly hardwiring. Then you have cultural, mm -hmm. familial, mm -hmm. peers, trauma, um, Parents in particular, as I talk about the family system um, and other, you know, life experiences that also shape personality, right? right. Um, so the answer when people ever ask me is it nature nurture is this, I say yes. And when you get older, it's also what I call unconscious choice. Mm. You're unconsciously choosing a personality Oh, uh, regardless of whether it's healthy or not. You, right. you know what I mean? Sure. It's like, I'm just unconsciously choosing my right. wild, crazy behavior. You know? Right. Um, but so in terms of self-understanding, self-perception, when you learned that you were a three, mm -hmm. did it change the way that you understood yourself in this short period of time as a parent, as a husband, uh, in the work that you do, uh, like what, what did it do for you? Yeah. Well, I think it, it really helped me see the, the, the driving force behind the good and the bad. Right. Uh, of the behaviors. That's why I love about Enneagram is the, 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 the contrast between healthy and unhealthy. And right. um, I love that. I, I think I, I tend to, I'm, I'm an optimistic person. Um, I'm a guy that's full of belief. I always believe there's a chance. I just do. I'm that guy that just, I always think there's a chance for something good to happen. But in this particular situation, I, I went introspective on the stuff that, that needed to get better. Right. Because, you know, candidly, I'm 46. Um, I hope that I'm halfway through. I hope I got 46 more. I'd like, you know, I'd like several more than that. But you know, I'm raising kids. I've got a, a ninth grader. I've got a seventh grader and a sixth grader. And so I realized how quick this is all happening. And I'm really, really conscious of, of the fact that I can be better as a husband. I can be better as a dad and that's going to help them. And to the right. extent that it helps them in whatever small way it is, it's really a burden that I have. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went in and I was like, Oh, okay, this explains why I interact with my wife the way I do. It explains why she says one thing and I hear another. So I think it's really incredible for, for marital conversation and communication. That's the hardest part about marriage is communication. Um, 
by the way, I told her the other night, I go, I love our kids, but I'm really starting to think that being an empty nester is going to really be fun. You know, <laughs> just, there's no, there's just not as much conflict. Like at any given time, you were in our house, you saw it. There's yeah. three kids, two dogs at any given, that's all orbiting at the same time. And at any given time, if I'm not healthy and she says something or the kid does something and I turn it in towards my performance and am I being loved and accepted as, you know, do you think I'm being a good dad or a good husband? Or did you appreciate right. the fact that I went and used the drill to do this stupid little menial task? And if you didn't say, honey, that was amazing. How did you do that? I started to see things about myself. That I was like, mm. oh gosh, you know, that's unhealthy. And I'm looking for, you know, affirmation in places that quite frankly, I don't need it. I, I just yeah. think that's what I walked away with. So, it's interesting about eights and threes. Another thing that I asked you if your dad was an eight, because sometimes that can make a three wonder if they're an eight. Uh, another um, reason is because they have a role model who's an eight. And this often happens. Number threes adapt, right? So they do one of their um, defense mechanisms is called identification. So if they have a role model or a hero, they, uh, or a corporation, right, let's say, they begin to identify not only with their masks, right, that sort of a thing. But I think they also say, I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to make my mask into the image of a role model, right? So it's a, it could be perceived as a silly question, but do you think it's possible in your life that there's a role model who is a strong eight who as a three you felt like i need to appear more like that person or i want to appear more like that person therefore i'm going to you know self-identify maybe more as an yeah eight. well that's a really interesting question uh i don't know uh, i i know that dave ramsey is somebody that i look up to and he's an eight um but I'm going to answer this the only way I know how. I, I don't know if these guys are eights, but I know that I looked up to people like John Maxwell and worked for John Maxwell and Dave Ramsey. And these guys had, at times, you would think they were an eight. Uh, I don't know if John's an eight. I think he's probably a three. But, but the point is, is that um, some of the things about the eight, the decisiveness, the strong fight for your ideals, it's got to be your way. I certainly am enamored by that in certain business people and other people that I've worked for. So I, I do see what you're saying that you can model that because you think, well, this is, if you're going to be an achiever, you're going to have to be this way. Mm -hmm. And I can see that. And it's really interesting that you just said that because if my mom was here right now, she'd be laughing so hard because she has always said that I've been a mimic. Mm. Yes. As a little guy, she would, I mean, I'm talking little. She was like, you were doing impressions for the whole family when you were seven and eight people that were on TV. And she goes, you would walk in a room. This is all stuff I hadn't even thought about until you just said that. But wow. my, my, my mom, she's coming back to me right now. She's going, you were always the kid. You would walk in the room and she would go, I would be holding your hand. And she goes, I would look down and she said, you would be scanning the entire room. Yes. And just incredibly observant. Wow. And I, I, I do have a mimic personality. I, cause my cousin said to me once he lives in Michigan, I'm born and raised in the South. And he said, every time you come up here, you start speaking like a Michigan. <laughs> and I'm not, and I'm not doing that on purpose. Right. No. Like yeah. he says yeah. it to me and I'm like, Oh, come on. You, you gotta be kidding me. He's like, no, I'm telling you every time you do it. So I do think what you're saying is absolutely true. Yes. So, Again, the identification thing we normally think of with threes as they identify with them, whatever mask they're wearing in the moment, they actually think they are that person. But I also believe that eights will find people in their lives they really admire uh, oftentimes uh, and adapt their personality in, yeah. a, it's a, in a different way to either win that person's approval, uh, to be like that person, even though, this is the hard part, they're abandoning their true selves to become like that person. I think mm. that's spot on. That is hitting me right between the eyes. Certainly mm. a much younger Ken, yeah. uh, but it's still there. Uh, I, I would tell you that I think my perspective on that is to win their approval. 
not to be more like right. that. You said it was one or the other. I think it's clearly both. But I think for me, it's heavily weighted towards, I turn into a chameleon right. just for the, hey, we're so much alike, you know, or whatever unhealthy thing that is. Right. So part of then the journey of the three is to move from the passion of self-deceit, meaning believing you are the adapted image that you're portraying mm. to win the crowd. Yep. To, to abandon that in order to uh, realize authentic selfhood. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't walk into a room, be able to scan the room, figure out what's going on, get on stage, and connect. That's not what I'm saying. No, what I'm saying is when you do that uh, with self-knowledge, self-awareness, and saying, this is my job. I'm a speaker. I get up here. My job is not to go... I'm going to be authentic, you know, you are, uh, you, because you're wired this way and you have a mission in this direction, yep. you can do that and not, but not abandon your authentic self to mm -hmm. do it. That's right. And when you turn it on on stage sometimes, and I've had to do it, you've had to do it to remember, this is not who I really am. You, you know, in other words, I'll give, let me give you an example. There's a, uh, a wonderful documentary Anthony, what's the name of it again? About the famous manager. Remember, he had Alice Cooper, he had Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix. It's an amazing documentary. Yes. Um, I'll look that up real quick. I can't remember. Oh, it's amazing. And Ken, if you haven't seen this, we're going to get you the title. It's amazing. No, I've He's got the to most, watch it. Probably the most successful music manager. Most wild story, life story ever, really. It's crazy. Yeah. I'm anyway, sure. he has managed Alice Cooper since the days when Alice Cooper couldn't get a job playing music at a McDonald's, wow. like in a toy, you know, in, in the playland section. And um, he said that he once asked Alice Cooper, and the, for those of you who are too young to remember, famous rock star. Yes. Um, uh, he once asked him, um, how do you, in the midst of, and he was a global phenomenon, how do you make it? Like, how do you survive this? Because here's how I do it. When I go out on stage or into places where I know I'm going to be interacting with people as Alice Cooper, mm -hmm. right? Air quotes. Well, I go in my closet and I get my Alice suit, suit mm -hmm. on. And I go out and I do my Alice thing. Mm. But when I come home, I always take it off yeah. and put it back in the closet. Right. Because if I go through life being Alice for everybody, yep. then I'm nobody. I, right. I'm just whoever that person wants me to be. It's called Supermensch, uh, The Legend of Shep Gordon. Is the name okay. Of that movie. Love it. Supermensch, The Legend of Shep Gordon. Oh, gosh, what a great document. Yeah. Um, yeah. And well, I think really that's, true. but it I is. think that's what a three has to remember more than any other type. Like, yeah, and you, kids have been great for me on that because, you oh, know, yeah. that event, we were together a couple months ago, you know, and, and I did a talk and it was well received and I felt all the things and felt like it went well. And my oldest son, Ty, was um, in the room and, uh, you know, and afterwards he just, he was just like, hey, man, uh, you going to take me and my buddies to a movie this weekend? You know what I mean? And it's, it's like, it's great because it's like, you know what I mean? It's, it's, you, oh, I know what you mean. You, you just, it, it's really good for you is my point. Cause you realize I'm dad to him. Yep. You know? Right. And he said some yeah. nice things later, you know, later he's like, dad, you were funny today. Right. You know, like that's all I got. But that's you know, good. It, oh that's yeah. Good. As long as you can separate your persona from your authentic self. And let's face it. We all, I mean, I think both you and I aspire to be authentic with our audiences. Yeah. But it's impossible to be completely authentic with our audience. In other words, there is, by nature, the moment you take a stage, a persona involved. It, it's actually a word that comes from the theatrical world of the Greeks, meaning, you know, mask, when they wore masks in performances. There's always a persona involved, right? But we want to manage that, keep it on, you know, you want to keep that on a leash. So let me right ask you, though. I don't disagree with you, but I, but I, you've seen me speak. We, we've spoken together. Yes. You've seen me yes. speak at least enough. And we've definitely hung out together where no one else right. is around. It's just us, two dudes hanging. I don't, I don't know that there's a big difference between me on stage than there is in person. 
Of course there is. I don't, what? It, energy? Um, well, well, that's about it. Like, I don't, my voice doesn't change. I don't have a different voice. No, not, no, 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 no. It's nothing like that. But you, as I do. Unless you're saying in that moment, I am, I am projecting like, hey, I've got a thought that I believe in and you need to hear it. And so it's more I'm, of a, yeah. And I'm is that what you mean? You're, yeah. You're also, let's face it, we're, it, it's more polished. It's more winsome. It, you're, you're, oh, I see what you're saying. You okay. know what I'm saying? You, I got and it. there, you know, there's the Ken Coleman thing. So let me, let me just put it to you this way. And this was so helpful to me. Uh, and this is a good question for threes, but also for a four who has a very strong three. I have to periodically ask myself, am I being Ian Cron right now? Or am I being Ian Cron right now? <laughs> I love the quote fingers. <laughs> so you know what I'm saying, right? I, I do. I do. But in all honesty, like I like on my radio show, I mean, Will, Will, Will does my publicity He's sitting right oh, here. Do, oh yeah. Will's right there waiting to lose his job. <laughs> no, Will's fine. Am I that much different on the radio than I am in person? I don't think so. Yeah. So I'm not disagreeing with you. I just try yeah. to understand what you mean by like, cause I don't go, all right, I'm about ready to be Ken Coleman when I go in the studio. I don't do that. Well, like I, like I'm, I think, I'm the, yeah, I think everybody does a Ken. All right. Everybody, everybody has an Anthony Skinner or an Ian Cron or a Ken Coleman. Right. And they have their true selves. Everybody okay. has a, everybody has a false self. Everybody okay. has a true See, self. See, that's what I'm struggling with is because I'm reading what you're saying and I'm going, does that mean I'm less authentic in it those moments? It means for threes, no, not necessarily. The, what threes have to be careful of more than any other type is the issue of authenticity. Right. Because I agree. Yes. Because of your desire to succeed and to appear successful and to win admiration, yeah. you will sometimes abandon your true self in order to become someone else that the crowd will love more because you don't believe in your unhealthiest place that you can be loved for who you are. You have to become whoever they want you to become in order to be loved or to experience love. Got which of it. course, which of course is a fool's errand because there is never enough of audience no. to, to convince yeah. with that, right? Yeah. And the very na the very fact that you have to practice it yes. lets you know that there are two, you know, there's a false self and a true self. That's why it's so important to you to you were talking about earlier that that to you know to be transformed more by the gaze of God than the gaze of your admirers or your audience, right? And you're, the reason that's an issue is because we have a true self and a false self. So it, because there is a quote, Ken Coleman, that's that's the tension. And that's why you have to keep practicing to move toward authenticity. That's right. No, I get it. I, I, I see it more in social settings. You know, if I'm hanging out with some influencers that I really admire, mm. like I could see the first time I met Ian and I would kind of more matriculate <laughs> his way. I see it there. What I was struggling with is, and in all honesty, is just I really – don't turn on, you know, right. like this entirely so, different guy when I'm on the right. air or on the stage. Right. So this gets us to the issue of subtypes. I think you are a particular version of the three. So there is uh, the three of all threes, right? That you always hear described is called the social three. There are two other threes. And there's one called a self-preservation three that I would encourage you to do a little research on. And what I can do is actually send you, I'm gonna send you a photo of two pages from a book on self-preservation threes. Uh, and then you tell me if it sounds a little bit more like your space of three, okay? Because mm -hmm. I'm not convinced you're a social three, which is the quintessential three. Like, like I can say this because they've all been on my show. Mike Hyatt is a quintessential three. He's a social three. Okay. Um, another social three, Don Miller is a social three. Okay. I don't think you're a social three. I think you're, my hunch is, or what I would encourage you to do, I don't know this, is to look at the self-preservation three. And I will just send you a two-page thing on self-preservation. What's the quick three. difference? Because people want to know. You can't just dangle that well, out Well, <laughs> okay. Well, the self-preservation three is actually the 
what's called the counter type. So you actually often don't look like a three. Um, the reason is because, I don't know how to say this as quickly as possible, but this is the three that you have the hardest time convincing there are three. In part because this three really wants to be good. This is a person who wants to be good. This is a person who wants to be virtuous, a person of integrity, uh, a person that is a model citizen, husband, father, uh, worker, colleague. This is a, do, you, do you see where I'm going? In other words, to them, that's success, okay? But there is a secret kind of vanity about being perceived as that model person. Uh. And, it, and so it's hard for them to accept that there are three because that would involve deceit and vanity. So this particular form of three has vanity around not being vain. <laughs> yes, the sweet irony. Yes, so that takes a lot to think about. And so what happens is oftentimes they think they're ones or they think they're sixes. Yeah, I, I got to tell you, I absolutely believe I'm a three. I just, I didn't mean to trip us up on that. I, no, I will okay. tell you, I will tell you that authenticity to me is, I think I have vanity around authenticity. <laughs> okay, that's, okay, so. I mean, because I mean, when you a, said it, I was like, be. I get turning the juice up a little bit, and I, and I get that. You know, if I'm sitting talking to you, we're having a cigar, I mean, obviously, I'm not going to talk exactly the way I do on my show. But the point is, is that I am, I feel like I'm every bit me. When I'm when I'm hosting yeah. my show, every bit I don't. That, so, that's what I was struggling with. Yes, self-preservation three. Research it. I think I think the vanity, even the 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 willingness to say I have vanity around my authenticity, is a is a way that kind of makes me go, hmm, that's very much more like a self-preservation three. Yeah, to uh, say may, that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, so, a couple of things, and then we got to wrap up. Um, first of all, threes are beautiful. They're wonderful human beings. The planet would not be here without threes doing what it's doing. When you're at your best and you're using your superpowers in service to what God, higher power, divine, whatever my listeners could choose to call this, uh, this higher person being in their lives, uh, you, you, you radiate glory. Uh, in, in a way that is um, reminds people of the glory of God in the world. When you're using it in your superpowers in service to your own ego's agenda of wanting to be loved, wanting to be seen, wanting to be admired, want to be known as a success, want to, you know, blah, yeah. blah, blah. You're, you're living with air quotes around your name. And you know, so for you, for all threes, the journey is to learn to self-observe mm. and realize when you're got air quotes around your name and you need to return to who you truly are in the moment. Yeah, that's right. And that takes a lifetime yeah. to say, okay, no, no more, no more chameleon games. I'm going to try and be who I am uh, consistently, regardless of my context, where I am, I'm always going to be the same person. Mm -hmm. And everybody should strive to be that. It just takes threes a little bit more effort. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. Because you know? we're constantly dealing with our own scoreboard. Yes. Yes. So I want to just highlight uh, a couple of things. Um, one is because it's, it's important for people to know you, you, you've got this great show the Ken Coleman show and the passion that you have mm -hmm. sort of, you know, around um, getting people connected to their true self uh, and then finding a career that aligns with who they are, with their mission. Uh, am I articulating this well? Yeah, I, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm deeply, deeply passionate uh, to help as many people as possible realize where they're supposed to contribute. I just believe that we were created to contribute. And uh, whether you're a person of faith or not, I, I doubt that there's anybody listening today or watching that has not laid awake at night at some point in their life and said, why am I here? Uh, or what should I do with my life? And the high level answer is contribute. 
And I focus on the work aspect. It's not workaholism. It's just there is a huge portion of your life you will spend working. And I believe that you should be able to use what you do best, your talent, yes. to do work you love. That's what I define as passion, to produce results that matter deeply to you. That's mission. And so simply put, where talent, passion, and mission, your talent, passion, and mission intersect. That's that contribution zone. I call it the sweet spot. That's a, that's not my metaphor. That's a metaphor that anybody who's ever watched any kind of sport understands that. And so mm. we're trying to help people get clear on those three indicators, if you will, talent, right. passion, and mission, and then see where in the marketplace can you contribute? Cause there's multiple ways to do that. It's not just one job, not just one career that you have to stress out about. Um, so that that's the core of what we do on the show. Don't you have something specific right now that's available? What's Sorry, that? Ian, don't you have something specific that's available right now? Oh yeah. Well, we've got a get hired course. We created it because we, you know, we had, we had somewhere between 38 to 40 million people unemployed, you know, three, four months ago. Now we're somewhere in that 20 million. And so we created a very simple digital course. Love to know, love to let people know about it. It's 20 bucks at Ken Coleman.com. It's called get hired. So this will work either if you're trying to figure out that dream job and get there, or if you just need something right now, to stabilize. And that's a lot of people right now. They know what the dream is and they've had to press pause or more importantly, COVID pressed the pause button for them. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's a simple course. I teach it and uh, it's 11 part video series that'll help you have the edge on getting hired right now because it's a tough market to get hired in. Mm. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So I love the idea that, and I, I think we've, we've spoken about this idea before that, you know, one of the, the things that I love that you do is help people move from being consumers to contributors. Yes. I mean, we, we live in a, in a culture that says, and advertising does it to us. Schools teach it to us, everything else. Uh, your, your job is to be a consumer, which if you think about it is an insulting word. Yes. You know, that, that people refer to other people as consumers. Right. Uh, right. instead of human beings, right? That's right. But how do we move from being uh, people who are concerned about consumption versus contribution? And I love about the fact that you're doing it. So that's the Ken Coleman Show. It's on Sirius YouTube channel, pod, the Ken Coleman Podcast. So, and of course, now the Get Hired course, which people can find on KenColeman.com. Um, and then I, I just want to say the, the takeaway for me from this this conversation is, Finding your Enneagram type is not as easy a journey or as mm. clear cut a journey as everybody thinks it should be. Like, um, you know, it's not like other personality typologies that spit out data and, you know, it's a journey to self understanding. And we are so complex that if people think it's not going to take a little bit of effort, they're crazy. Well, mm. the thing I was going to um, ask you is, so now that I know I'm in that three space and I'm going to do some more reading on that self-preservation uh, angle of the three. I mean, what, what do we do? What do I do next? How do I, how do I step forward uh, in every aspect of my life um, with this information that I have? Well, I would say two things. Um, well, I, well, here's one thing I would tell you because I'm actually very excited about it. Uh, you know, we just finished filming a course and it's called True You, A Deeper Exploration Into Your Enneagram Type. And actually, you're the perfect candidate for it because now you know your number. <laughs> and, then people, and then people ask the question, well, now that I know my number, does that just make me interesting at cocktail parties or able to talk to my friends? And then, you know, you and Rachel Cruz can laugh at oh, each other. Oh, yeah, it's so it, fun. Right? That's not really what the Enneagram is for, right. although that's fun. It, it is meant for deep yep. spiritual transformational work. So True You, A Deeper Exploration into Your Enneagram Type is a course that I designed. And here's what makes it unique. Most courses give, go through all nine types and give brief descriptions of each. So maybe 30 minutes if you're lucky, right? On each type. Um, and so you don't get a deep dive into any single one type. You, you get a flyby. In this, uh, in this training, there are nine different courses, one for each type. So you could go right now, or when, actually the, the wait list just opened today, you could go there right now and say, yeah, I wanna take this course, and I wanna get the three, you know, uh, module, or whatever we call it, 
and I want to get, you know, uh, Dave's, Dave Ramsey's, I want to learn about eights, or I want to yep. learn about ones. So I'm going to buy those three modules. And if you're going to get 90 minutes on your type, and I'm going to cover things like your, I'm going to cover subtypes, instincts, virtues, passions, basic fears and desires. Um, I mean, just a whole host of stuff that would take you to the next layer of knowledge that you need to accelerate your journey toward embodying the highest expression of yourself. I can't, the course comes out early October. The wait list just went live today, uh, which is uh, September 9th. So who knows where, I'm, I'm not sure when this is dropping, Anthony, but <clears> of <throat> course maybe live is right now as we speak. But uh, I'm so excited about it because I'm able to teach each number for 90 minutes yeah, at least. Right. And so people get a ton of attention and they don't, they can just cherry pick from yep. the nine numbers, which ones they want to yep. learn about. So which, I'm, I'm, I love that. I, I think it's great. I think every married couple should do it just to be able oh, to learn about their, you know, it, I just think it'd know, be huge. If someone had done this as a premarital with me and my wife, oh, if someone yeah. had said to me, right. here's the three and the nine, you know, courses yeah. from Ian's training true you. Right. It would have saved us a lot mm, of heartache. Yeah, I'm sure. And, and misunderstanding. I'm sure. Uh, I, mean, I got an idea so for your I'm podcast. About it. You need to get Bring couples it. on that are the same number. Is Stacy a three? Yeah. That's right. But I wasn't doing it for the cheap therapy. I just was saying I think it's a novel <laughs> idea because because you and I were talking, we, we will keep their names private because there people right. know them. But we were talking about some friends. One is an eight and one is a one. And you were yes. like, oh, boy. And, and I thought, well, that's interesting. But then what happens when the spouses are the same number? Is, you know, that's a fascinating deal. Yeah. Well, um, I will just say one thing and then we'll sign off. <laughs> one of the things they have to do, two numbers for you and Stacy, is you have to make sure that you don't, uh, um, mutually reinforce the worst side of the three in each of yourselves. Mm. So in other words, that you get into a feedback loop, right? Where you're uh, encouraging to do the not great stuff of the three with each other. Does that make sense? Of course like we've all heard about the power couple who are two threes. Right. And you know that they're just encouraging one another to be on the low side of three. Right. Uh, versus yep. on the high side of three. That's right. That's really so, well said. So what I would say is, you know, th this course, I'll, you know, I will gift you the three course. The two of you should sit down and watch it. And oh, you're very nice. I, I see. There it is. He's doing it again, folks. I know I wasn't going for that. I wasn't going for it. Now I'm like, I'm gonna lose all kinds of sleep <laughs> over this. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, no that's really great. But I, I do listen. Uh, Ian's become a friend and I know I'm a guest on his show, but, and they can always edit this out, but I really, I think every married couple who wants to get serious about commitment and really given marriage a shot to be the beautiful thing that it is, they've got to do this course. I think it's incredible, incredible well, opportunity. I really do. Thank you. And I'm praying that it, uh, that it, it helps some folks along with the IEQ nine assessment, which I think also, uh, Oh yeah. If you, if you haven't taken it, you can go to my website, ianmorgancron.com. You can take the IQ9, get your number, and then go to the course and find that number's 90 minutes. Yep, right? I think that's Read smart. up on your report and then go take the thing. So I, this has been great. Hey, well, that's that's nice because I always love hanging out with you. So um, we got to get our next uh, cigar session on the books. Well, uh, on, uh, next week we will be in Seaside. Uh, I know you love Seaside. I do, man. I love uh, me some Seaside. So we're going next week uh, to take a little week off after Good a for long you. run. And uh, please, nobody try and rob my house because I actually have a large college student here and two dogs. So you may not want to do that. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and that means you, Ken. Actually, I was right. actually directing that toward you. Right. Um, we're going to be together again soon when I get back. Anthony... I love you. Love you. Anthony. Typology. Anthony, I love you as well. Same, Ken, and I'm in on that next smoke. Oh, good. Yes. Right. There's always room for one more. All right. Hey, Typology Thanks, Tribe, don't forget the words of the great Oscar Wilde. Be yourself. 
everybody else is already taken. Until next time.